Okay, here we are, 319, in uh, um, part two of our lecture for unit three on um, abstraction and expressionism. When we left off, I was pointing out that these two guys down below are not expressionists, but their ideas definitely developed alongside each other. That is expressionism and Oppie and Craig. Um, are, they, they parallel and have similarities. Here's what expressionism is up to from an agenda standpoint. <clears throat> to portray the inner life of humanity, which in the expressionist viewpoint is largely isolated and nightmarish. Again, go back to the monk painting, the scream, right? That's sometimes how humanity feels. Doesn't it feel that way to be human? Sometimes, hopefully not all the time, right? Isolated, you're trying to get other people to understand you and they can't. Nightmarish, nothing works out and you just wanna stand on a pier at sunset and scream, right? So expressionism says, let's take that idea that monk portrayed and that a lot of humans feel and figure out how to put it on stage. Or in another one of these lovely grandiose weird things that, that abstract thinkers say, we need to dramatize the essential life of the soul. Again, go do that next time you're trying to write a play. Okay, my play is going to dramatize the essential life of the human soul. Big ideas, big ambition, I kind of like it. And a last piece of this, expressionists were really worried about the loss of humanity in a modern society. When we're driven by science and technology and forward progress all the time, what happens, say the expressionists, to our individualism, to our humanity, to our personhood, right? Do we not just become machines in the larger machine uh, or cogs in the larger machine of humanity and society, right? <laughs> Bullet point three certainly hasn't lost any relevance uh, in the 21st century with the onslaught of AI and all of the other computing power that we have and are about to have. So that's what expressionism wants to do from an agenda standpoint, right? So here are some examples of expressionism. Frank Vedekind's Spring's Awakening, written 1891, produced 1906, made into a rock musical several years later. Um, right, you're familiar with Spring Awakening, but this is a story about um, a bunch of high school kids coming of age, and it is really, it really embellishes all of the taboo subjects of the age. It talks about pregnancy. One of the guys is closeted and gay. There's a there's a sexual assault in it. There's abortion. Like this is a scandalous play in a lot of different ways. Here's a picture of the uh, um, one of the students talking to the headmasters of the school um, where they go. And again, look at the visuals here. The design is not all the way to complete abstraction. Um, there are a handful of choices here. Like the, all these guys at the table are raised up a little bit, but you know, and sort of minimalist in its design. Uh, look at the white wall instead of some detailed wood paneling. Yeah. So that's a good example of, of expressionism um, from Germany. Here's some American expressionism. The Hairy Ape, Eugene O'Neill, 1922. Um, our main character, bottom left here, his name is Yank. He's a guy on a steamship, upper left. What he does in the steamship is he shovels coal into the boilers. That's it right? He and all these other working class guys shovel coal into the boilers. And what you're seeing upper left is this uh, woman, young woman, wants to come down and like look at the workers. It's almost like she's going to a zoo, right? And she says sort of some flippant things and then leaves. And Yank, and this is bottom left again, Yank is like, why do we all have to put up with this crap? And he leaves the steamer when it's in port in New York City, going in search of the girl. He's not really sure what he wants to do, tell her off. I don't know. Everything outside of the ship is a complete bizarre nightmare. Take a look at the set design on the right. This is a more contemporary production um, of Harry Ape. But like he walks down Fifth Avenue and no one responds to anything he does or says. He tries to punch somebody and his hand bounces off. Um, and long story short, he goes, he goes to a union house. They think he's a spy. They kick him out. He gets sent to jail. He gets out of jail. He's wandering around, and he finds the only thing he thinks will have any understanding of who he is, which is this enormous ape in a cage at the zoo. And he opens the door to the cage and basically says, you'll understand me. Life is shit. You'll understand me. And the ape crushes him to death, and the play is over. So super cheerful, right? Here's another one. Talk about some good expressionistic design here. Um, Elmer Rice's The Adding Machine, 1923. Mr. Zero on the right here is an accountant. He's replaced by an adding machine. Fear of modern technology. He kills his boss, is convicted, executed, goes to a sort of heaven called Elysium, is reborn, and the whole thing starts over again, right? So check out the jury here pointing at him, convicting, condemning. Look at even like the geometry of the little witness box he's in. Everything here is just slightly distorted. 
um, in a way that makes it feel and seem nightmarish. The black backdrop, all of it, right? So those are some examples of, of expressionism. Here is um, a photograph of the original production of Machina. So here we are, and you'll see it when you read the play. This, this is from the honeymoon scene. Um, so it's somewhat realistic, realistic chair, right? Uh, window treatments, the furniture, et cetera, is pretty realistic. But, and this picture's a, a little rough, everything else is black. There's no further interior here, right? So we're working in some realism, but also some of this spare, minimally impactful design. Um, here's the courtroom scene from the play. And again, a lot of this looks like a courtroom. A lot of it really specifically doesn't, including the fact that we have this like that backdrop, this obviously not real backdrop, and you can see the curtains behind it. And you can see the shadows projecting onto the curtains. So we're creating these senses of some realism, historically specific costumes, chairs, etc., and some anti-realism. And you'll see that a lot as you go through the play, right? So expressionism, stylistically speaking, seeks to create deliberate, deliberate distortions to nightmarish effect. And you all have had a nightmare at one point in your life and you know what that feels like. It's like kind of real, but also kind of not real. And it's that distortion that adds to the nightmarishness of it sometimes. Characters in expressionism frequently speak with abbreviated staccato speech. It's kind of realistic and then sometimes it's not. When you're reading that first scene of Machina, which takes place in the office where our main character works, listen to the staccato rhythms, almost mechanical rhythms of the way those people talk. Heavy use of non-realistic sound effects. I shouldn't have to say much about that one because it's all over the place in Machina. You'll see that one, right? Abstract or exaggerated characters. Our main character in Machina is just named young woman, right? Everybody pretty much in that play is just named who they are. So there's an abstraction to the character that says, she's not just this person, she's every woman to a degree, right? Um, and that's a common thing where we have these abstract or exaggerated characters. And then the thing you need to remember when you're dealing with expressionism is that by and large, you are riding around inside the head of your main character. You're going through the emotional experience of that main character experiencing it just like they do, right? Generally speaking, expressionism relies on episodic plot structure, sometimes to distort and disorient, right? A nice linear plot structure like Ibsen, like Hedda Gabler, a linear plot structure is easy to follow. One thing moves quickly and easily to the next thing. The thing that happened five minutes ago is the thing that happened and now we're in this scene, etc. right? <laughs> Just look at the progression of time through the episodic plot structure of Machinal. She goes from this state, which is unmarried, to this next state, which is on her honeymoon. No, actually jump one more forward from that, which is having a baby for the first time in like 20 minutes of stage time. That's episodic plot structure to create this disorienting feel of what it's like to be alive. So find stylistic choices made by Sophie Treadwell in this play that fit expressionism and talk about the impact of those choices in the discussion document. We'll leave it here for part two and we'll be back. Uh, I'll come back for part three where we'll talk about Treadwell and first wave feminism.